Brought to you by the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver. Standards Matter, a podcast about professionalism and accountability in real estate. The following scenario is inspired by a real professional conduct case. Some details have been altered for storytelling purposes, and we've removed all identifying information to respect the privacy of those involved. It was approaching midnight, and realtor Jeff Muller's eyes were getting heavy. After a day of showings, paperwork, and his son's soccer practice, he was ready to call it a night. He just needed to add some MLS comparables to a CMA for his seller. Jeff knew that a condo, similar to his clients, sold in Granville Gardens a few weeks ago, but it wasn't showing up in Paragon. He thought fatigue might be setting in, so he rechecked his search criteria. Still, no luck. In a last-ditch effort, Jeff removed all search filters, and there it was. Unit 701 and Granville Gardens. A closer look showed that the listing was terminated and didn't sell. He leaned back in his chair, confused. He knew it sold. The building was around the corner from him, and he saw the sold sticker on display out front for weeks. Frustrated that he couldn't get the information he needed, he closed his laptop. He'd have to call the board tomorrow, just another thing to add to his busy schedule. What he didn't know then was that phone call would trigger an investigation and lead to fines and other disciplinary action against two of his colleagues in real estate. Welcome to the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver's Standards Matter podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Westaway. In each episode, we walk through real professional conduct and arbitration cases and give realtors practical insight on how to meet your professional obligations and serve your clients better. Our professional standards and legal advisors vet and approve all information in this podcast. In this episode, we consider the integrity of the MLS system and what happens when we undervalue having complete, accurate, and reliable information in our profession. Later, I'll speak with ethics guy Kim Spencer about the rules of cooperation and the factors that make the MLS the most important tool in the Realtor Toolbox. Now, on to the case. Jen Swift of Cut Above Realty was struggling. She'd been in the business three years, had a limited client base, and was trying to stay afloat in a declining market. Sales were slowing and prices and consumer confidence were falling. One by one, her buyer clients became reluctant and her sellers took their homes off the market to weather the storm. Before long, Jen was left with almost nothing, but she was a fighter. She soon made an action plan and headed out into the neighborhood with stacks of brochures to prospect the old-fashioned way. She knocked on door after door, introducing herself to potential clients. It was tough, but she saw it as a numbers game. If she kept working at it, she'd find that diamond in the rough client. And she did. It was the perfect prospect. He was looking to sell his 10-year-old condominium in a sought-after part of the city. There was one catch. The buyer was a lawyer, and he wanted to apply his legal training to the MLS contract. He insisted on including a listing cancellation procedure in the contract. This procedure required the listing brokerage to cancel the listing contract and enter into an exclusive listing contract in the event of an accepted offer. He valued his privacy and didn't want the sale price on MLS for Looky Lose to see. Jen was hesitant. Her training told her that the MLS listing contract contained tried and tested legal language and it isn't to be changed except for a few minor exceptions. The client had already written the clause to include in the Schedule A. It stated that, The seller has given the listing brokerage and its representatives the authority to inform the buyers and the buyer's agent about the listing cancellation procedure only upon removals of all subjects on the accepted offer. She pondered the situation. This was a written instruction from her client. Aren't we required to follow the wishes of our clients so long as we get it in writing? She decided to send it to her managing broker for approval. He had decades of experience in real estate. If this request was offside of the rules, he'd let her know. The worst thing that could happen, she thought, was that her broker says no. Two days later, her broker signed off, and the brokerage loaded the contract and listing on the MLS. The home garnered immediate interest. Jen and her client priced it sharply, and after a few weeks and some open houses, they had a solid offer. The negotiations were quick, and Jen and the buyer's agent struck a deal for their clients. 
Everyone walked away happy. A successful sale behind her, her future in real estate was looking brighter, she thought. That was until Jeff Muller, frustrated with his CMA, called the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver. The board's MLS team investigated. After a thorough audit, the team found the altered listing contract and no record of the sale on the MLS. They looked the home up through the land titles and saw the sale. The matter was sent to the board's professional conduct committee to investigate. The committee contacted Jen and her managing broker. The evidence was clear. Jen erred in allowing her client to alter the contract and failed to report the sale on MLS. The committee also concluded that her broker either failed in his responsibility to review the Schedule A terms or failed to ensure that their contractual obligations were consistent with their professional obligations to protect the value and integrity of the MLS data and to respect the role of the cooperating brokerage. Specifically, both parties violated the rules of cooperation. Section 3.03 which says that all listings must use the appropriate standard MLS listing contract provided by the board, which can't be altered or amended outside of a narrow set of exceptions around marketing the property outlined in the rules. And section 5.01, which states that sales shall be reported to the MLS by the listing brokerage on the sales report form together with a legible copy of the contract of purchase and sale within five calendar days of the contract becoming unconditional. Members are not permitted to avoid these reporting responsibilities by, for example, cancelling a listing between receipt or anticipated receipt and acceptance of an offer, or encouraging a seller to do so. Jen and her managing broker admitted to the wrongdoing and consented to the Professional Conduct Committee's recommended disciplinary actions. These included completing mandatory courses at their own expense, having their consent to discipline case published for all other members to see, and to paying hefty fines. Jen and her managing broker could have easily avoided this situation. But why is reporting MLS sales so important to the board? To find out, I sat down with ethics guy Kim Spencer to discuss. So, Kim, why is reporting sales so important to the integrity of our MLS? Thanks, Andrew. It's a great question. We're, we're asked it quite often. Reporting sales in a timely manner into the MLS system is the best way of ensuring that that system has accurate, up-to-date data. So why is that important? Well, because members rely on accurate, up-to-date data to properly advise their clients. The MLS system has a reputation just like members do and just like their brokerages do. It has an excellent reputation because we ride herd on members who don't report sales and who report inaccurate information to the system. If we didn't do that and the MLS system got a reputation for not being accurate, where would we be? Not in a very good place. So that's the basis for that rule and for other similar rules like that. Okay, so why can't a member avoid reporting a sale if it's a written instruction from their client? Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense on the surface, doesn't it? You're an agent. You have to follow your client's lawful instructions, and that is a lawful instruction. However, it's not an instruction that you can accept without getting into harm's way with the rules of cooperation. Think of it this way. When you use Facebook, Instagram, or or any other online application, or your bank card, or, or whatever, by using that thing, that system, you are agreeing to the terms of use of that system. The terms of use of our system are the rules of cooperation, and the rules of cooperation specifically say that if you list a property on the MLS system, you are agreeing in advance with your client that all of the rules of cooperation apply, except for the ones that the seller can otherwise instruct. There's only six, (laughs) and not reporting the sale is not one of them. There you go. So we already kind of covered this in your first answer, but what makes the MLS such an invaluable tool? Do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I do. Back in the mists of time when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was a (laughs) real estate agent and quite frankly, not a great one. Um, I was an okay one, but that might've had something to do with 18% interest rates. I don't know. But (laughs) what I do recall is that back in those days, There was really no online MLS system 
my company had an online system, but it was really pretty hit and miss. So if I had to do a CMA, or if I had to try and find a property for a buyer, I would have actually quite a lot of trouble because at least half the properties for sale were not listed on MLS. Mm. And so to find a suitable property for my buyers, I used to get in my car and drive up and down the streets looking for for sale signs. Oh, man. Not, yeah, not very efficient. Can you imagine? Oh, no. how, yeah, just with the click of a finger, you can see pretty much everything that's for sale. Think of the commercial real estate market and the fact that there's a lot of exclusive listings. And it can be quite frustrating trying to find properties for clients and assess values because of the lack of information, because of all the exclusives. Imagine what that would be like if the residential market were like that. Right. I think a lot of our members would agree that that is a scary thought. (laughs) So what about altering the MLS contract? Why is that such a concern? Well, it's similar to the answer I gave before. The MLS system depends on the rules of cooperation and the standard form that defines the relationship between the seller and the brokerage. Remember, it's the brokerage that owns the listing, the Mm. contracts between the seller and the brokerage. It defines the relationship between the parties. And uh, we simply don't allow, with the exception of drawing a line through the for sale sign reference, we don't allow uh, contracts to be amended. Mm. And that is because for all of the listings that are posted in the MLS system and all of the thousands and thousands of members, they have to be assured that when they're dealing with a listing posted in the MLS system, that they know what the rules are. If we started allowing, or if the board allowed members to deviate from the rules or change the wording of the contracts, where would we be? You'd have to phone and check every single time with a colleague to find out what the story is for that particular property. It doesn't make any sense. It'd be massively inefficient. It would be a a, a significant risk management issue for members. It's just better to say, look, here are the rules. Here's the contract. You want the MLS system? This is what you get. Fair enough. Uh, So what advice would you have for the broker in this case? Well, the broker in this case, listen, I was a broker. And if you can imagine what it's like to be a broker, you have lots of people in your office calling you, asking for advice all day long. You've got all these regulatory things that you have to do. And so when you actually come into your office, in your inbox, either real or virtual, there's a stack of listings. There's a stack of listings. There's a stack of deals. You have to review them, sign off on them so that they can be dealt with by your administration staff. So it's possible, uh, human beings being what they are, it's possible that could just have been missed. Mm. And, and, and one hopes that it was just that. It was a clerical error. Uh, if the broker, however, noticed that, accepted it, didn't do anything about it, then that's an issue. And it's, mm. it's an issue for the professional conduct committee because the committee tends to look at individual members who make mistakes differently from brokers who make mistakes, who are supposed to be in active control of the office and know all the rules. Right. So following in that vein, what advice would you give to the realtor, uh, to a realtor who may be in a similar situation to what we saw in this case? Sure. You remember Nancy Reagan? <laughs> I mean. I don't, but I know who she is. <laughs> she, well, she, her big campaign was was the war on drugs, as, as they put it. And she used, her mantra was, just say no. <laughs> and it's, just, it's as simple as that. And I, I, I have the, listen, if you're not driving the bus, the bus is going to drive you. Mm. You're the agent. You're there to sometimes save your client from themselves. You, you have to tell your client, look, I can't accept that instruction. It's as simple as that. Right. On MLS, this is what you get. Thanks, Kim. Now, on to our member mailbag segment, where we take your questions about the rules, responsibilities, and common situations you face in your work. Kim has agreed to stick around to help us answer a question from one of our members. Our first question is from David Lee of Team 3000 Realty. 
David asks, when I first joined the industry, it was standard practice that when you visit a listing, you would give the listing agent your business card when entering the home. I've noticed in the last few years, this practice is hardly done. When I ask the buyer's agent for their business cards, they don't have any on them. Some run to their cars to find one. I know with COVID, some don't give any out now, but at least have a photo of your card on your phone so you can text it. I like to keep track of agents who show my listings so I can identify who's coming through. Besides being the courteous thing to do, is there any rule regarding this? Simple answer is no. But there's a difference between is there a rule that you have to follow, like not altering MLS contracts, and expected business conduct or stuff that's considered not cool. Not a breach of the rules, but it's considered not cool. But look, I, I think there's some sort of demographic dimensions to this. Old fossils like me expect business cards. That, that's just the way it is. It's like shaking hands. It's like calling people on the phone. It's like identifying yourself on the phone saying, hey, I'm Kim Spencer from XYZ Realty. That isn't so much fashionable today, but it's not a breach. So when someone phones you and says, starts talking, doesn't identify themselves, it's just the way it is. Some people prefer to give business cards and others appreciate getting them, but there's no requirement to provide one. I do like the remark about, well, I just like to know who's in the property and you should have a photocopy of your business card. I think that's an excellent suggestion. You save it in your iPhone as a favorite uh, because it, it does suggest there's at least a minimal amount of security screening right. for that person to get into the property. So I, I think that's a reasonable request. All right. Thank you, Kim, for sticking around to answer that for us. Andrew, it's my pleasure. Can't wait till the next time. Do you have a question for an ethics or rules expert at the board? We'd love to hear it. Reach out to us at our REBGV's member Facebook group or shoot us an email at standardsmatter at rebgv.org. For more information on professionalism, including our conduct and arbitration cases, visit our member website at www.rebgv.ca. That's a wrap on episode two of Standards Matter. I've been your host, Andrea Westaway. We plan to regularly produce new segments to engage you in conversations about standards, accountability, and professionalism in real estate. On behalf of the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Standards Matter. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate us and subscribe in your favorite podcast app. Brought to you by the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver.